So I'm going to get started here. And how fast do you think you get set up? OK, you're recording? Fantastic. Live. Oh, crap. <laughs> hey, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Aloha. I'm not from Hawaii or anything. Uh, I just love that. I love what they do. Um, oh, no. Here's what we do, right? The stars at night are big and bright. I love that. That's so awesome. Um, I am a Texas transplant, so that is super, super awesome. Uh, I moved here from North Idaho. I'm from the Northwest, so um, I'm a Yankee, I guess, by Texan standards. <coughs> but I'm really excited to be here today um, and to share this talk with you guys. This is the first time I've given this talk, so I'd appreciate any notes and feedback when I crash and burn. Tell me where I went wrong and how I can improve. I would really appreciate that. Um, so you're, you're kind of my, my guinea pig crowd for this talk. Um, today, uh, as you may have noticed, the, the thing, your title isn't really up there, the thing in your thing, but the thing is the thing, so don't worry about it. Um, it's the same talk. We're going to talk about how to hire a great UX designer. And you'll see why I call it the Triforce of UX here in a little bit. But first you're wondering, who the heck is this guy? So I'm Brandon. I'm an experienced designer. I love media of all kinds. Books, music, theater, art games, uh, architecture, design, pretty much anything. Um, I hate country, sorry. It's just, I, I never really got into it. But I love Conway Twitty, uh, Kenny Rogers, where they tell stories, you know, like my 80-year-old mom listened to when I grew up. I like that kind of stuff. So, so there's that. I, but I do love a lot of stuff. I'm a huge sci-fi nerd. Uh, I'm a 17 veteran of marriage. So I uh, got that going for me. My wife proposed to me uh, after our third date. So that was pretty awesome. Uh, we've never had a fight in 17 years. That's one thing I'm very proud of. I've made a lot of mistakes, but my wife and I are pretty awesome, I think. Uh, I love projects that improve customers' happiness and success by discovering and addressing their needs and pain points. Um, I've been doing this for about 16 years. I am bald, but uh, it's OK. Um, and uh, I practice kung fu. I'm a cat person. If you work with me, you'll discover that everything reminds me of a movie, a TV show, or a song, or a meme. And those songs will promptly get posted to Slack. Um, and uh, what else we got going on here? Yes, I'm a cat person. I love pop culture. And I am a creative director for Precocity up in Plano. Um, so that's a little bit, or a lot of bit, about me. So the preface. So um, a little while ago, uh, I was at Improving Enterprises, so up until last January. So you, you guys may know them. Um, and I was working with a fantastic client, and, but I got an amazing chance and opportunity to go to, to, to go to Precocity, and so I went ahead and took it. But in leaving my client, we had a fantastic relationship, and my client said, hey, I want to replace you with someone just like you. How do I do that, right? How do I get that person? And he said, what are the three questions? Just give me three questions were the three things I need to look for in this client, in this, or in this new, new designer that I'm going to hire. And so he said, what three skills would you place as most important, and, and how would you phrase some questions to figure out what those three things are? So what good nerd worth their salt can be asked to, cog to put together a list of three things without thinking about the Triforce, right? So. <coughs> This, this talk, this series of blog posts that I, that I had was born. So the Triforce is one of the most iconic symbols in video game lore. In Nintendo's The Legend of Zelda, it's an omnipotent sacred relic. So there's a lot of people in here who may not know what Triforce is. And it represents, the, there are three pieces and they represent the Triforce. Each individual thing is called a Triforce in its own right. Uh, in Zelda, they represent power, wisdom, and courage. For my part, the Triforce of UX is empathy, curiosity, and humility. So the TLDR of this entire talk, those are the three things to look for. Empathy, curiosity, and humility. So as we begin, as always, it is dangerous to go alone. So take this. We're going to start with the Triforce of Empathy. So <coughs> in Zelda, your health is measured how? Hearts, right? 
So the more hearts you have, the more health you have, and the stronger you are, the longer you'll live, the longer you'll last in battle. The same is true in UX. You need to have those hearts. So ask yourself a couple of questions. So these are questions that you need to ask yourself, all right? So does this candidate know how to get into the heads and hearts of the people that we're talking to? Can they walk a mile in their shoes? Or is this some hot shot my experience designer? You guys know what a my ex designer is, right? UX is a user experience designer. But you're gonna run into this industry a lot of my ex designers. These are people who say, my experience will dictate how this application is designed. My experience is gonna dictate how we design it and what, what the users think. I'm right, the user's wrong. They're gonna go atop Mount Sinai and they're gonna come down from that mountain with the stone mock-ups from on high. And they're gonna deliver the greatest UX you've ever seen, okay? This is a my ex designer. You don't want this designer. You need to be really careful because they're all about themselves. What we do as UX designers is we get in the heads of others. And someone whose ego is just a little bit too big for the room has a, a great deal of difficulty understanding or even caring about the needs of the people they're designing the software for. UX at its heart, okay, is, is empathy, right? It's not just for the users, because the best designers are negotiators, mediators, and bridge builders, right? UX designer, you're the hub of the wheel of your product team. Your stakeholders talk to the UX, your POs talk to UX, your architects and devs talk to UX, users talk to UX. Everybody talks to UX. Everybody works with this person or people, this team, right? In office space, right? They're the people people. I talk to the so-and-so, so so-and-so so -so doesn't have to. And if that person is all about themselves and not worried about the spokes that connect them to the rest of the team, you're gonna have problems. UX designers bind in the disparate parts into a functional whole, okay, with a centered and unified focus. They don't make enemies, they make allies. They build, okay? Those are the kind of people you need to look for. And empathy is at the core of that. Do they care about the rest of the people on the team? Are they putting the needs of the team before their own? Because at the end of the day, a UX designer is a facilitator, okay? They're not coming up with all sorts of wonderful ideas from this hole they sit in up atop Mount Sinai. They're gathering in data from all over the place, out of people. They're sucking thoughts and feelings and goals and desires out of the business team and the dev team and the users to try to come to a cohesive experience. So you're, you're, when designing solutions, the best UX designers is gonna, they're gonna be juggling all of this research, all of these notes, and they're gonna try to come up with a solution that fits the customer first, and then the others accordingly. So, these are the three questions that you need to ask to discover if this candidate has empathy. First, what is your primary goal as a UX designer? What do you wanna do here? After all the chit chat, ice breaking and weather talk, open with this. We wanna discover if this candidate's metal model of UX aligns with yours and your teams. Their answer to this question and how quickly they respond could help save both of you an hour wasted, right? Or worse, you know, months and years of, of, a, of a hire. If you don't sync up here, there's not much reason to continue the conversation, right? So this is straight out of the gate. What do you wanna do here, all right? The answer that I look for is I wanna make people rock stars. Okay, you're gonna notice a theme with my slides. I tried to pick the most egregious, most outlandish, nasty stock photos you could find. This is kind of the antithetical slide deck of a designer. So that was my Google search for rock star user, right? So take with that what you will. But that's what we do here. You've got a product, you want people to use it. People wanna use your product when they feel awesome using it. When they feel great, when it makes them feel like they've accomplished something, like it makes them feel, if it's part of their job, make them rock stars at their job. Hey Johnson, did you get those reports for me? Well, of course I did. They were in your inbox yesterday because I did all this footwork in this awesome app that I use and it made my job easy and now you already have all the things you need to do your job. Well, Johnson, you're amazing, thank you, right? That's, that's what we're looking for. And Johnson knows it wasn't me, it was just because I have this awesome piece of software that allowed me to be great at what I do. 
So then you want to look for the list order they rank the things that they want to do as they sift through the responses. So they may have never voiced um, this, this kind of thing verbally, so give them a chance, right? Um, interviewing's hard, but they might first mention stuff, stream of consciousness, and then say, okay, you listed these four or five things. Would you list those for me in, in, in rank and file? So the things that I look for in terms of importance, they need to first focus on end users. That's what they need to care about most. They need to be Tron. They need to fight for the user. User experience design, okay? It's not the CEO, it's not the business stakeholder, it's not the, the developers, it's the user. That needs to be their, their uh, North Star. Next, do they care about shipping the product the client or business actually wants? We still have people that write checks. We have people that have goals. They wanna make money, they wanna build a business, they wanna do lots of things. They have, they're called stakeholders for a reason. They have stake in the game. They have skin in the game, M probably more so than the user at the beginning. So you need to care about them as well. But in my opinion, user comes first. Can they speak to helping the business steer clear of pitfalls and mistakes using their expertise and position to guide the business to the best possible version of that business vision? And thirdly, sorry. My slides aren't building well. So users, you got the sort of users, you got the sort of business, right? And then lastly, you've got the sort of technology. Okay, last but never least, do they care about the humans that are actually gonna build this? How many of my people in here are developers, architects? Do you guys feel like you guys are given a top tier experience when building a product or do you feel like you're at the bottom of the hill where all the crap rolls down and lands on you. In the middle, at the top? Cool, where do you work? What? Awesome, that's fantastic, right? How many of you have worked at places where you were at the bottom of the hill and everything ran down, ran down on you, right? I, was brought, I came to Dallas because a team of developers threatened to quit, the entire team, if they didn't hire a UX designer to help, help rein in um, the, the design process, it was, it was an agency who forgot that their end product was software and not a poster. And so at the end of a two month cycle, the, the developers were given a week and a half to build a responsive website of this thing that they hadn't seen until a couple of hours ago. And oh, by the way, so sorry about those 80 hour weeks you're about to have, and then ship us up our product, right? You have to realize there are people that are actually gonna build this. Do they care that you're gonna spend time away from your families sinking your heart and soul into the code of this thing? The designers need to care about that. If they don't consider users and business and technology, you don't want that person. They're not looking at the big picture. What a UX designer should do is take all of those and fuse them together and become the hub. So see how my three swords became a hub of a cool wheel? That's designing. So never be anxious to volunteer other people's time. Empathy, guys, empathy. Okay, question number two. Tell me about your user research techniques and methodologies. Here's where we're starting to get into soft skills. Can they talk to other people? Are they meek as a mouse? Is she a blustering blackguard? Right? Neither is optimal. Even if you have separated your UX research role from your UX design role, which is very common, they still need to have a broad overlap of skills, and a lot of this is soft skills. The very conversation you're currently having with this candidate will help you suss out much of their natural biases and abilities. But to be a good researcher, they also have to be, have a conscious and purposeful method. Because you're gonna send these people out to clients or to users, you're gonna put them at Starbucks in front of a million strangers and have them showcase your app to people who've never seen it before. Who do you want doing that? You want you know, uh, Newman from Seinfeld, or, or who's the guy from Office Space? Milton? Um, Milton? Milton, right? Okay. So, man, you, do you want that guy as your UX designer? No. He might be a great researcher of some kind. He might be a great designer, but you don't want him in front of people. It's just not going to work. They have to be people people. And good people people are empathetic, right? So talk about the things. Can they, when, they do, when do they do their research? Why do they do it? Can they talk to people? Can they help customers talk about themselves? One of the hardest things of my job as a designer is to sit down with somebody and get them to talk out loud, stream of consciousness. 
Because a lot of these people, they've never done it. They don't know what to do, and they're afraid to hurt your feelings. You have to be able to set a stage where people can talk freely about stuff that you made and tell you that it sucks really bad, and then they have to not care. That's the person you're looking for. Question number three for empathy. Who has final say in what a UI looks like and why? This is a, this is a big one, and it can be difficult. This, my answer to this question has cost me at least one job. They asked me this question, I answered, and they told me I was wrong, I defended it, and I didn't get that job. In the end, it's a really good thing because it would have been awful, right? It would have been a horrible experience for both of us. <coughs> but fair warning, my answer to here, to this question, there are monsters here. In my not so humble opinion, the answer to this question, who is in charge of what the UI looks like and why is, the developer. My friend, uh, Tim Rayburn, .NET developer, and you, he's an architect, uh, d developer extraordinaire, said, decisions are made by those who show up. I love that. It's great for meetings and, oh, I didn't get that memo. Well, you weren't there. We made a decision. Life moved on. For me, it's about UIs are designed by those who commit code. I am not saying designers should learn to code. I do think designers should learn to code just a little bit, but that's not what I'm saying here. What I'm saying is UIs are designed by code committers because when all was said and done, that sketch file or that PSD file you made went to the garbage. But code was shipped, and that's what users see, and that's what users interact with. Perception is reality, and users can only perceive what they see and work with. At the end of the day, they don't know a designer spent months or years or whatever researching and designing. If the developer botched the whole thing when they implemented it and that's what got shipped, guess who designed your app? The developer. Contrast that, I've seen crappy designers put in, co put in designs and the developer go, yuck, that sucks. They fixed it, shipped it, and it was better. It, it swings both ways, guys. But at the end of the day, the code that gets shipped is the design. Developers dictate what your design is. We make suggestions. Developers, they do it. And when a designer builds a relationship of trust and accountability with those developers, everyone's jobs become exponentially easier and better. Why? Because so much of what a designer does is consensus building and human coordination. Do you sense a theme here? Empathy, right? It's vital that the UX designer, the hub of all these human interactions, recognize where their true power lies, okay? Another thing Tim likes to say, the PSD is a lie. It is. Your mock-up is a lie. It's not real. It's not real data. It's not real users. It's not real stuff until a coder sits down and attaches it to a database and gets live data dynamically streaming in. It's a lie. You don't know what that thing looks like. But Brandon, you say, we have peer reviews and QA and UAT and checkpoints and sprint reviews, all of that to ensure that the developer actually built what got designed. That's great. If you can do that, keep it going. But self-managing and self-correcting teams, which is the core of agile development, should create processes and checks and balances that work for them, right? So I prefer to trust my team and execute well and then look to me for confirmation rather than approval. Hey, Brandon, I built this. Does this look right? Yeah, looks great. Hey, Brandon, I built this. Does this look right? No. Why? Well, because I changed it. Okay, why? Well, let me tell you why. I love this quote. You can't read it. <laughs> Present a good team with problems, and they'll thrive on finding solutions. Ask them to implement your solution, and they will only find problems. Some might say that stakeholders and, and CEOs and POs and UI look and feel, they own that because they write the checks. I've actually heard people say, those developers better build what got designed or they won't have a job. Eh, who wants to work for that person? Who wants to work there? Yuck, right? It's about trust and accountability. And you need designers who can empathize with them and create a process that works for all of the parties involved, not just top-down kind of stuff. Because UX designers, again, are the hub of interaction. They are the wheel. Oh, that was pretty, pretty awesome. See, 
I did all the mistakes. I used transitions and, and animations that you can't use in presentations because I could in this one. So you get to see the flame one and the roll one. You get to see the dissolve one. It's pretty cool. Oh, the fireworks one. When the, when the My UX designer comes in, I know it sucks, but it's fireworks. It's awesome. All right? So empathy. Your UX designer is the hub. If the hub of the wheel doesn't work well, the whole wheel ceases to work. So we've covered the first triforce of UX, empathy. Can these people, do they have a heart? And the next up, having unearthed the first foundational triforce of UX, empathy. Next, the hero must discover, face the void, and discover the next but most equally powerful triforce of curiosity. Right? In The Legend of Zelda, you begin with very little things. You acquire new relics and tools and weapons, and as you seek and discover hidden treasures, you learn new things, right? It's like a cheap box of crappy chocolates. You never know what you're going to get until you bite in it, and soon you go, yuck, and you throw it in the garbage, right? That's what gameplay and a lot of UX research is like. Um, much like attending a talk that you're not quite sure what's going to happen, so then you walk out because why would I want to be here? So, but that's okay. I empathize with him. I've been there. Yeah? See what I did? See what I did? So when considering a UX candidate who is curious, ask yourself some questions. Do they want to get in the heads and hearts of users? Do they care about that? Do they foster a healthy nature of inquiry, and do they harbor a desire to always be learning something new? Or is this a my experience designer, right? So do they think that their experience and knowledge and anecdotal evidence will be enough to develop this, right? To stop progress, stop learning. I don't need to know anymore, just let me go, right? A lot of what we do starts there, but it can never end there. Banksy, all artists are willing to suffer for their work, but why are so few prepared to learn to draw? Alan Cooper read that and said, all UX designers are willing to have empathy with their users, but why are so few prepared to learn interaction design? Right, so you're gonna meet a lot of people who are super empathetic. Oh, I love the users, fight for the users. But then they don't learn the skills necessary to do their freaking jobs. They don't learn how to mind map and how to journey map and how to do, uh, how to build personae, how to interview people, how to run usability tests, both guerrilla and formal. There, is so many, there are so many tools available to UX designers today. It's, it's insane. But without a deep-seated desire to learn, to empty our cups and fill them anew, we ossify, become stagnant knowers of history. Right? You want to hire builders of the future not knowers of history, because knowing, come on, help me out. It's half the battle. Oh, good, you kept going. But remember, it's only half the freaking battle. There's a whole other half to win. Often it's blue and red lasers, but in our job, right, the best designers provide the best solutions to the problem context. They can do this because they know what the actual problems are. They know the actual problems because they ask the right questions of the right people at the right times. They ask the right questions because they did their research. They researched because they were curious to find the actual problems. They were curious to find the actual problems because they wanted to find the best solutions. And they wanted to find the best solutions because they felt empathy for the users. They sought empathy because they were humble and were curious to see if there was something new to discover. That's virtually my entire talk in one little slide, okay? It's, it's a chiasma, right? If you don't know what a chiasma is, is go look it up, K-I-A-S-M-A. -A. So, what are the questions for curiosity? What inspires you? Light bulb, right? Nobody wants an uninspired designer. It's kind of our core competency, but a lot of the way, re, ways we describe design is, that's inspired. Wow, that's so creative, right? But a lot of people think that inspiration and creativity are epiphanies or original invention, and that's just not the case, especially in software design. Most wheels have already been invented, and UX design is largely looking at the wheel patterns other people have established and coming up with new and interesting ways of putting them together, right? Is the Tesla a new car? No. Everything that exists in the Tesla existed well, I mean, uh, at least as far as 2007, if you encounter the touch screens, right, 
a little bit of AI, a little bit of photoelectrics, and you had electric motors that have been around for hundreds of years. They just brought all things, those things together to blow our minds. Huge Tesla fan. Wife didn't let me pre-order the three. But we had the talk. She watched the thing with me, which was cool. Um, nobody wants an uninspired designer, right? But <laughs> the thing is, we all have knowledge. This is, uh, man, mm. sorry about the light in here. This is a map of The Legend of Zelda, the first game of the world. And as you w walked around the world, you would discover new parts of the world, and then you could look at your map and see what you'd already discovered. So you would never actually see this, because there was no way to get over, well, you might, if there was a secret portal that took you there, but you don't know how to walk there, right? This is knowledge, guys. Everybody has knowledge. This is experience. It's taking those disparate bits of, of knowledge and connecting them. Steve Jobs said, creativity is just connecting things. When you ask creative people how they did something, they feel a little guilty because they didn't really do it. They just saw something. It seemed obvious to them after a while. That's because they were able to connect experiences they've had and synthesize new things. And the reason they were able to do that was that they've had more experiences or they have thought more about their experiences than other people. Unfortunately, that's too rare a commodity. A lot of people in our industry haven't had very diverse experiences, so they don't have enough dots to connect, and they end up with very linear solutions without a broad perspective on the problem. The broader one's understanding of the human experience, the better design we will have. Knowledge, experience, and the great designers experience things. They experience things because they're curious, and they go out to conferences like this and the meetups. Right? And they, they read books, and they search the web. They do things. When you ask your candidates about what inspires them, you're delving into their knowledge and knowledge mapping experience. How deep is their well of experiences? How diverse? Are they a spread thin generalist, a mile wide and an inch deep? Or are they a super focused, laser focused specialist, an inch wide and a mile deep? Or are they something in between? You might want one or both. Both are valid. It's okay to have a ma jack of all trades, master of none. That's a totally legit person to hire if that's what you're looking for. It's also okay to hire specialists, right? UX people are generally a little bit more broad than that, but you need to know what you're getting into, right? Because without change, something sleeps inside of us, and then you get eaten by a sandworm. So use their portfolio. I have this set up a different way, so I can't actually see the current slide. So I am totally going to fix that tomorrow for my next talk. But so here we go. Use their resume and portfolio and their website and their Twitter bio and LinkedIn and other recommendations and whatever it is that you have to guide you to probing questions regardless of anything else and regarding past experiences and projects? How do they get the knowledge they have? What urges them onward to acquire new knowledge? How have they applied this stuff? Can they connect the dots between all of those things? All right? Wait, 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 you say, Brandon. First, you basically inferred that a designer relying on their own knowledge and experience was a bad thing. And now you're saying that's where inspiration comes from? <gasps> Which is it? All right? That's a great question. And I'm so glad you asked. Remember Steve Jobs' talk, a lot of designers haven't had very diverse experiences, and therefore they end up with very linear solutions, right? So I interpret this to mean that they aren't knowledge, not that they aren't knowledgeable, but that the scope of their knowledge leads them to banal or simple or possibly incorrect solutions. Remember, it's about connecting those dots. Do they have enough experience, and then can they connect all of those things? Old knowledge is helpful, but new knowledge will be the key that unlocks the best solution for new problems, right? Anybody seen uh, Big Hero 6? All right. Uh, so um, this is an awesome example. So, man, I should kind of skip it because we don't have sound. But if you've seen the movie, uh, Callahan, big inventor, invents this technology. Hero takes that technology and invents Microbot, or he invents uh, his, his battle bot, right, his fighting bot. And then he needs to invent something new, but he doesn't know what. And so, how, does this work? So. Right, so you got Hero here, right here. His older brother is saying, all you have to do is build something amazing and you'll get into this awesome robotic school. And he says, hey, no problem, I've got this, right? And so he's really excited about it. 
and he grabs his pencil. I'm gonna design the best thing ever. And he's miserable. He tries and tries and tries, and he can't think of anything new. He can't think of what he should do. And his brother says, oh, washed up at, what is he, 13, 12, something like that. He says, what you need to do is get a new perspective. See things from another angle. And he's like, like what? Ugh. And then he sees this bot that he built. And he's like, wait a minute. I could do something with that. And then we cut to the, uh, the standard, you know, what are they called? Yeah, yeah. We, we, we cut to that, and he, you know, he, he builds all that stuff, and, and he builds these amazing inventions. And it goes off before, before we get there. But that's the point. We have lots of experiences, and sometimes the best designs and the best inspiration comes from using that knowledge to build something new from it. So depending on where your company is based geographically and the candidate's personality type, they may have only interacted with other UX designers via books or forums or websites, and that's okay. What you're trying to determine is if this candidate operates in a vacuum or if they seek new learning, right? So are they involved? Do they do things? UX has been around a really, really long time, okay? One day, <coughs> I got a phone call, and it was much on a phone like this. No, it wasn't that long ago. But this recruiter said, hey, you'd be perfect for a UX role. And I said, awesome, what's UX? And she said, well, that's what you do. And I said, it is? And she said, absolutely. She had looked at my resume, found it, and determined that I was a UX designer. So I said, okay. So I learned a little bit about what it was. I called the startup, got the job, became a UX designer, because apparently it's what I was already doing. But now there's a legit practice to what I'd been doing. I'd just been kind of winging it, thinking I'd been inventing things all this time. Lo and behold, I'd been around for years. So then I started reading books. I got the inmates are running the asylum, about face, the design of everyday things, don't make me think, rocket surgery made easy. I read them all. And all of a sudden, a whole new world opened up to me, new tools, new methods, right? New things that I, I'd never thought of before. These books and many more are only one way to be involved. So remember, it doesn't take a, a certain personality type to be a UX designer. They don't have to speak at conferences, go to conferences. There's a lot of ways to be curious. There are a lot of ways to learn new things. So how are they getting involved? Secondly, do they have mentors? Does the candidate have one? Do they have more than one? Who are they and how often do they meet? We need to meet more. <laughs> we need, my mentor just walked in. It was a pretty opportune time, so, but we really need to meet more. Um, why or why not? Why aren't they meeting? What are their career aspirations? These mentors will help you determine how hungry this candidate is for new knowledge and industry participation outside of their day to day, all right? Do they speak at these events? Are they finding ways to get involved? A lot of public large group stuff uh, intimidate some types of people. So don't make that the only thing. Oh, you don't speak at any conferences, so we're not gonna hire you. No, don't do that. I've known some amazing uh, designers with introverted tendencies, and that's, that's okay. They're still good in front of people. They're still good at pitching. They're still good at everything a UX designer does. It's just, it, it costs more for them. I feed off of this kind of stuff. This is. This is my wheelhouse. They can do it, but it, it costs them energy. That's the only difference. They're still amazing designers. It doesn't matter what their personality type is. Your end game is to discern how and when they learn or if they seek learning and growth at all. And the third question is, when was the last time you learned something new? What was it and who taught you? How did it change you? Are they constantly learning? Are they constantly growing? That's what's important. Okay, did they read something this morning that got them thinking about something at work in a new way? Or was this new thing they learned so long ago that the knowledge is now old hat and irrelevant, right? Do these people change? Are they open to change, all right? So, a fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. This is important with this question, okay? You need to give them a few minutes to formulate a response. We don't have parents at home asking us, how was your day? What did you learn today? Right? I do that every night with my kids, but they don't do that. It's hard to answer. What was, the what was the last thing you guys learned? Hopefully it was something in here, but before then, what was the last thing you learned? How did it change you? It's, it's kind of hard, right? So when you ask this question, <coughs> give them some time. Uh, I've actually had people, um, I had a fantastic uh, interview 
with Jamin Hegeman from Adaptive Path, and he asked me a really, really deep question. And he said, uh, I want you to spend the next five minutes thinking about your answer. I'm gonna go get some water, uh, and I'll get you some water too, and when you come back, go ahead and feel free to take some notes. Um, I'll be back in five minutes. And he left the room. That's how deep you want them to dive here. Some people may be able to just go, oh my gosh, this morning I read the most amazing thing, and then off they go, and that's cool. But let them dig deep. Because remember, we're looking for that breadth. Can they connect the dots of those experiences they've had? So uh, this meaningful break can give you both an opportunity to stop and take a breath, to connect the deeper thoughts and memories without the pressure of an immediate response. So again, I, I highly suggest that technique. Leave the room, or just or set a timer, right? Because you can also use this as an opportunity to see how the candidate formulates deeper, more complex ideas, because that's exactly what you're hiring them to do, okay? Um, given the additional time allowed, you're now also allowed to look for something deeper than rote responses that they may have memorized. Did they use the time to formulate something meaningful? Did they delve deeper and discover something perhaps even new to them, okay? Did they learn anything from this experience? And that is the Triforce of curiosity. Next and lastly, humility. So, so far we've conquered the big bosses of apathy with empathy, of indifference with curiosity. And now our hero faces the greatest force of destruction the world has ever known, pride. If our hero can overcome pride to at least take hold, to at last take hold of the Triforce of humility, the Triforce of UX will once again be whole. In The Legend of Zelda, okay, for those of you who don't know, Ganon, he's the bad guy, he takes the Triforce because he wants to conquer and rule and destroy with its power. The underdog, he, Link, must fight incredible odds to defeat Ganon's minions, find the pieces of the Triforce and combine them in order to defeat the much more powerful foe. One of the things I love most about the Triforce, though, is that it can be wielded by both good and evil people. All of the tools we have for UX can be used for evil. Just look at GoDaddy. Okay? And I'm not joking. I know UX designers who quit working at GoDaddy because they were told to use dark patterns to engage people in a negative way so that they were forced to call so they could upsell them over the phone. Any tool is a tool. Use it for good or evil. So the things wrought by those tools are reflections of the tool holder, not the tool itself just like the Triforce. So the Triforce, is, if it's wielded by, by one out of balance, so they prize one of the Triforces over the other, it will grant them some short-term power, but then it will break itself apart and scatter again, okay? So this is a quote from Zelda. If the heart of the one who holds the sacred triangle has all three forces in balance, that one will again, will gain the true force to govern all. But if that one's heart is not in balance, the Triforce will separate into three parts, okay? But even the people, the good people who started wielding it eventually could become tainted. So in this reason, a lot of the storylines, Link decides to give up the Triforce once his enemy is defeated. What's more humble than having all the power in the known universe, but then giving it up because you know it could corrupt you, right? So that's why I posit the pinnacle piece of the Triforce of UX is humility. It's the same for us. So when considering humility, ask yourself some questions. Does the candidate seek to build up others or themselves? Do they want to impose their will or establish trust right, in the team and balance? Do they use their position as a weapon or do they build a team? Do they bind people together, okay? Or is this another my experience designer, okay? Is it, are they always right? Is it their way or the highway, okay? How do they deal with criticism or critiques? What happens when a junior developer tells them their design sucks and she found a better way? Right? Did they act like that? That was so fun to discover that you could animate that in Keynote, and none of you will ever get to use it like this unless you do a stupid presentation just like this one. So I highly recommend it. You get it. Oh, so, so, so much fun in Keynote. So humility in design isn't new. Just Google it. Google humility in design. There are thousands of pages about people talking about this very topic. Again, I discovered it for myself and then researched it, and lo and behold, the wheel had already been invented, and there was a lot of great material out there, just like everything else, okay? I didn't invent this. So, three questions. All right, so the first question. Ask them, tell me about a time when you were wrong. Tell me about a time that you failed. 
I have been here, okay? Um, are they humble enough to admit that they've made a mistake, then take action to rectify it? As leaders, we don't wanna be alpha buffalo, our herds following blindly. You need to be able to trust each other and know that when things go awry, that you've built a team that will put out the fire and then tell you about it, rather than call you in a panic asking what you would do, okay? The ability to recognize one's own mistakes is key in design. Only then are we able to subordinate our wills and desires for the greater good of the product. Okay, is this candidate humble enough to accept that they've made a mistake, that they're wrong? How will they interact? How will they react when you tell them they've messed up really bad and they have to redo everything? Okay, what if a pitch goes awry or goes south and they hate it? What do they do? There's a saying based on a line by Robert I. Sutton, to to fight like you know you're right, listen like you know you're wrong. I would like to posit that we prototype like you know you're right and test like you know you're wrong, okay? There, there has to be hubris in all of us. I could not stand here and present to you unless I took pride in my work, unless I was proud of this talk, and, and I felt like I was offering something new or a different perspective on something you may not have heard before. That is pride in and of itself, in a way. The thing is, we all have that, but can we think about, can I do better? Can I look at this thing I made and make it better? This lovely baby that I, I, I created, can I destroy it and build a better one, okay? Oftentimes, when we look at people using our products, it feels like this, right? The struggle is real. Oh my gosh, they're so dumb. My design is awesome. It must be the user's fault. They're complete idiots. Don't they know you just pour it from the top? What's wrong with them, right? That's how it feels. But you have to have the user do this and you go, interesting. Can you tell me why you're sucking on the bottom of the glass? <laughs> what makes you think that licking the side of the glass is how you're gonna get at the beverage inside? Do you know that your goal is to acquire the beverage that is inside, that, right? And you have to come up with nice ways to find out why your design failed, okay? Because every person you meet knows something you don't. Confidence is incredibly important. But without the balance of humility, a designer eventually stands alone and apart from the team. Empathy is supplanted by apathy and curiosity by indifference. And it takes incredible confidence to put your stuff out there, have it catch on fire and burn, and go back to the drawing board. That confidence is bred by humility. So question number two, a developer calls you over to the desk to show you what they've implemented, but it's radically different from the thing you designed. What do you do? This is how some designers look at developers, right? So I've been here, guys. I've been here on a project I worked on with Adam. One of our architects, Sharpie, called me over and he says, Brandon, I want you to take a look at this. And he showed it to me and I go, well, that's not how I designed it. And he goes, I know, your design sucked and let me tell you why. He goes, here is your wireframe, here's your prototype, and here's what I made. So as we use your prototype, it works great. And now as we come over here, here's what happened. I built what you designed and it sucked. And I came up with a better way and I wanna show it to you now. Here it is, what do you think? And I said, Sharpie, you're brilliant. This is so much better than the thing I designed. And he goes, awesome, I'm glad you feel that way. Can I, can I commit this? And I said, absolutely. Because we didn't know exactly what that finite problem was for that one thing until we could see it in working functioning code. There was no way I could have come up with the solution he did until we had shipped some code. He did it and found a better way. And because we trusted each other, he was able to approach me and say, I know I'm not a designer, but I came up with a better way. And I was humble enough to say, <laughs> wow, I suck, I'm sorry. Thank you for not making me look like an idiot and shipping a crappy design, right? We helped each other. Other times it goes the other way. Hey, Brandon, come over here. I wanna show you this thing I did. No, buddy, oh, so kind of you. But no, you can't do that and here's why. And I need to, you need to be able to have the ability to humbly tell them why they can't do that. It has to be this other way, right? Humility isn't thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. So do they freak out when people critique them? Do they get defensive? Are they inextricably intertwined with these things, right? And the third question, 
You know you're right, but everybody tells you to do it a different way, including the CEO, right? What do you do? I've been here before too, guys, right? It sucks. We had a product, they wanted it done a certain way, I didn't want it done that way, and I fought and fought and fought, and it shipped that way anyway, and they were right. I was wrong, and I made $60,000 because I was wrong. <laughs> I felt awful. I didn't know back then. I've been on the other side of things too. Same project I was working on with Adam here. I was right, and they were wrong. And I fought, and I fought, and I fought, and it just drove a wedge between us and the C me and the CEO. And in the end, it didn't really matter. I should have just humbled myself, shut up, and not tried to die on that hill. So guys, I hope I've taken your hearts from this to this today, and I'd like to leave you with the Triforce of UX. Ed Catmill and Creativity Inc. said this. I believe the best designers acknowledge and make room for what they do not know, not just because humility is a virtue, but because until one adopts the mindset, the most striking breakthroughs cannot occur. I believe that designers must loosen the controls, not tighten them. They must accept risk. They must trust the people they work with and strive to clear the path for them. And always, they must pay attention to and engage with anything that creates fear. Moreover, successful designers embrace the reality that their models may be wrong or incomplete. Only when we admit we don't know can we ever hope to learn it. Thank you.